Okay, our, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker. It's uh, Professor Maximilian Offheimer. Uh, he's the George Pardee Jr. Professor of International Sustainable Development at Berkeley. Um, uh, he's formerly been a, a Humboldt Fellow and also winner of the Cosarelli Prize. Maximilian. Ridiculously long night name, and then they gave me a chair that made it, you know, 60, 60 uh, letters longer. So, thank you very much for, for having me today. Uh, it's always tough to follow a, a, a talk that is a best practice example of clarity and, and have a World Food Prize winner in the room. So, I don't get nervous very often, but today is one of these days where you'll hear my voice tremble occasionally. Uh, so, what I was asked to do is spend 25 minutes exactly. Uh, on talking a little bit about how an economist thinks about the challenges uh, that are ahead when we're thinking about climate change over the next, uh, I don't know, 100 years. It's baked in for a longer time than that, but I can't think for more than uh, 100 years ahead. Uh, so I will focus on some of the challenges, and Madhu is going to fill in with whatever I, I didn't do and be clearer and more organized than, than I will be here. So whenever I get I get worried about the future. Uh, for those of us who have small children, we spend a lot of time worrying. Uh, I, and I need to convince myself that we can find solutions. I look at this picture. This is a pretty amazing picture to me. This is the record of yields for the four main food crops in the world uh, since 1960. If you're looking at what's happened to yields, even with the variation in here, uh, you've got the, the main growing regions and the purple line here is world averages. Uh, yields, on average, have at least doubled for most of the, the crops over this time period, which to me is just an incredible achievement of both technology and, and, and farming practices over this relatively uh, short time period when we think about human existence uh, as a whole. Uh, if you're thinking about where these crops go, right, uh, they go into people's mouths or they go into animals' mouths and then those go into people's mouths. Uh, if you take the four main food crops uh, that are responsible for about 75% of the calories going to humans, and you uh, divide the number of calories from these crops by about 2,000 calories a day, those four food crops alone, if you just do the simple calculation, which is problematic, I acknowledge, but there's enough calories grown to, to feed the human population today. There's, of course, issues that we convert these calories uh, through inefficient processes into proteins and so on. Uh, food security is inherently a local problem. So there are lots and lots of issues involved here. But overall, from a global perspective here, these, uh, this trend in yield growth has really uh, allowed us to grow enough calories to feed at least most of the humans on this, on this planet. Just one more yield picture, and then I promise I will move on to the, what I was asked to really talk about, but this is just astonishing to me. I'm from California. Uh, actually, that's where I live now. I'm not from there. Uh, if you look at specialty crops uh, since 1940, so here the y-axis has uh, a one normalized by 1940 yields, and you look to the year 2010, for some specialty crops, we haven't doubled yields, right? We've increased yields tenfold, which is just even more uh, impressive. So a lot of the, the research that, that was spoken about in the, in the previous talk that goes into improving yields both by what type of uh, uh, types of strawberries you plant and how we plant them and what pesticides we use to in order to make sure that critters don't eat it but they get into your uh, strawberry ice cream sundae. Uh, the progress here is just truly amazing. So what I want to talk about is not strawberries, even though they're delicious, they're just not that important. Uh, what I want to talk about is, to me, the most important food crop in the world, which is rice. Right? Rice feeds more humans than any other crop uh, in the world. 90% of rice is produced and consumed uh, in Asia. And the statistic that always sort of floors me is that rice receives somewhere between a quarter and a third of the world's developed freshwater resources. So it's both an important crop from a nutritional point of view, but it also uses a tremendous amount of our uh, water resources, which is something we're going to talk about more as this conference goes along. If you start studying rice, which many of you have, it's just a fascinating crop. It's grown in many different settings. Uh, the most high, pr highly productive settings in which it's grown are irrigated uh, rice growing systems. If you go to the northern parts of India or California for that matter, uh, 
rice is grown in these irrigated uh, fields. That's 75 percent of production. And then there's uh, 20 percent of it comes from rain-fed lowland uh, production, which is essentially monsoon-fed uh, rice. And then there's some other lower productivity systems. Now what happened to yields, and I'll show you a picture in a second, and this is what, what we saw in the previous presentation too, yields uh, during the Green Revolution just exploded, right? They exploded because irrigation infrastructure was rolled out, uh, more efficient irrigation technologies were put in place, the rollout and development of pesticides in high yielding varieties, which work mostly in, in irrigated systems, and just the expansion of crop area led to an explosion of output. So if we take uh, a look at where rice is grown today, this is actually about 10 years ago, but that's the, the data I could find. If we look at where rain-fed rice is grown in the world, each dot here represents 10,000 hectares. This is from the, the Foreign Agricultural Service. You see that in the north uh, eastern parts of, of India, uh, that's where, where rain-fed rice is, is uh, mostly concentrated. China looks relatively empty here. And then if we switch this picture to irrigated rice, I mean, this is, uh, I show this to my six-year-old sometimes. He's not so excited about it. But I find this, this, this little click here just absolutely astonishing. This is irrigation water, right? This is surface irrigation water and pumped irrigation water that grows the majority of the world's uh, rice that feeds a, a billions and billions of, of people. Now, this is all impressive, right? These are systems that have been in development for essentially thousands of, of years. Uh, we have become incredibly good at, at growing rice in a variety of settings, and there are strands of rice that have been developed to thrive in different types of settings, depending on what the, the local climate looks like. If you speak to the folks at Erie in, in, in the Philippines, it's always a, a, an amazing conversation to be had about what's already been done and what's on the, on the horizon in terms of uh, rice growing. Now, if we take a closer look at what I think is a very important uh, area of, for, for rice growing, this is uh, rain-fed rice grown in the wet season in India. These are not the most highly productive rice systems, but these are rice systems that feed a massive number of, of folks that live in rural areas that grow rice for subsistence or for the people living in their, in their villages. So Karif is the, the wet season. This is monsoon-fed rice that's grown from the end of summer through uh, our winter here. Uh, and if you look at from 1965 to 1975, blue is million metric tons of rice output. The green line is a smooth polynomial here. And if you see from the, the curvature of the green line, you see what, what Steve said earlier is this increase in the growth rate of, of rice output. And then something happened in the mid-1980s. There was an inflection point and the growth rate of this rice output simply decelerated, right? Output's still growing, but it's growing at a much, much slower rate than it was before. And this is, of course, a reason for concern. Now, before I start switching into my, my climate uh, discussion here, I want to make sure that I don't come across as somebody who thinks that all of this is due to climate change. Clearly, the slowdown in the growth rate of, of output here uh, we'll see some climate mechanisms in here, but there are lots of other explanations, right? Irrigation infrastructure is slowly wearing out. Uh, there are sort of productive efficiencies that, you know, grew very rapidly in the beginning and, and are leveling out. Uh, pesticides may no longer be as effective as they used to be. Fertilizers may no longer be as effective as they used to be at improving yields. So there are lots and lots of agronomic and, and economic reasons why we might see that. But one thing we definitely want to worry about since when we think about climate change, the late 1960s to the early 1980s is when we started really detecting a climate uh, signal in the data. Does climate change play a role in the slowdown of this growth, of, uh, growth rate of yields over the past 20 to 30 yield, years and going forward? So I will talk about that for the rest of my time here. I'll focus on rice initially, and then I'll step back and take a broader look at the other three main food crop crops in the world. And then during questions, you can ask me how strawberries uh, will do. Uh, and the answer is, I don't know. Uh, so if you read the massive literature on rice, uh, I am not an agronomist, so if I use some uh, suboptimal terms, I apologize. 
But my read of the, the literature hypothesizes a number of pathways through which uh, climate and, and changes in climate may actually affect rice yields. So the number one thing that, that people worry about generally with global warming, because the data are, are pretty good, the models agree going forward that that's what's going to happen, is the role of rising temperature. Uh, if you look at when temperature actually matters to the rice plants, and I'll show you this in more detail in a second, it's not during the entire growth phase of the rice plant. There are certain parts of the life cycle of the rice plant where temperature is actually really important and other parts where it's not that important. But one thing that really matters, as we'll see later, is that there's a differential sensitivity of the rice plant from uh, relative to nighttime versus daytime temperatures. Rice really hates warm nights, all right? And we see that in the data, and I'll show that to you in a second. We've also observed in the climate data that nighttime temperatures generally have been rising much faster than, than daytime temperatures. So this is a, an issue here. The other thing we're noticing in the, the research there for on-field plants in the hands of farmers is, is, is not as good, but changing relative humidity, meaning how much humidity actually surrounds the rice plants affects the rice plant's ability to transpiration cool. Uh, which is problematic if we're thinking about how climate change may actually affect evapotranspiration from uh, the soil and the humidity surrounding rice plants. Uh, the third thing, and a lot of research has gone into that, is the notion of water stress. Rice hates too much water and too little water, right? It needs just the right kind of water. So if you have extended periods of droughts, meaning if your monsoon rain uh, falls in a bunch of extreme events and then there's extended periods of no rainfall or there's too little rainfall overall, or if there's too much water that the rice plant gets submerged, the rice plant doesn't like it. Uh, the third thing that the rice plant certainly doesn't like is if salt water intrudes into the fields and, and saline concentrations get too high. Last but not least, the final mechanism here is CO2 fertilization. And we actually don't know as much as we would like to know about CO2 fertilization effect on rice yields. There's evidence from crop models, but I'll talk about what, what an economist issues with crop models are in a second. Uh, we don't know how good increased surface concentrations of CO2 will be for rice yields in actual uh, field settings. So that's a big unknown uh, in, the, in the empirical literature here. So if you're thinking about, uh, if you wanted to get a sort of first stab at what the sensitivity of the rice plant is to these important dimensions of climate, uh, what you do is you grow in experimental settings uh, rice under different experimental uh, concentrations of whatever it is you want to vary, right? So you could think about varying temperature, you could think about varying uh, radiation, you could think about varying water concentrations. What happens in a lot of these fields is you apply inputs optimally to these plants so they get the right amount of fertilizer, they get the soil they like, they get whatever is optimal for these plants, and then you impose stress on the plant along one of those dimensions. You either make it hotter than the plant likes or colder than the plant likes or you apply more CO2 and you compare yields for different treatment groups relative to sort of a status quo type plant. So this is a study in PNAS a couple of years ago by Peng and co-authors who looked at experimental farms and basically looked at correlations between minimum temperature radiation and maximum temperature and grain yields. And the bottom two rows here are different uh, important indicators of how well the rice plant does. But if you just look at the top row here, they found a significant negative relationship between minimum temperature and rice yields and a significant positive but nonlinear uh, relationship between radiation and, and grain yield and no relationship between maximum temperature and grain yields. Now here comes my gripe, and this gripe isn't personal. Right? So this is a battle that, that uh, sort of crop modelers and economists have not fought but amicably discussed over the years is this is great, right? but this leaves out the most important actor when you think about global agriculture, which is the farmer. Right? The farmer in the field doesn't always optimally apply all inputs, doesn't have perfect information, and in many settings, especially in these rural settings where you're depending on, on rain to come in at the right time and making optimal decisions in terms of planting, doesn't always have neither the information nor resources to treat the plant uh, optimally. So 
here's how this economist, not all economists, but how this economist thinks partially about this problem, right? So before you actually plant your plant, you've got to figure out how much of your land to plant to a certain crop. So you might look at how much money you got for your crop last period, what the support prices are the government guarantees you, how much labor, fertilizer, and pesticides are this year. You might look for signs of early rainfall as to whether it's going to be a good season or not. And you might look at your land, how much of your land did you plant to that crop in the previous season, and that certainly determines, due to fixed costs investments, how much land you're going to plant this season. So then you put your rice in the ground, right? Uh, and you're praying for rain or you're turning on your, your irrigation uh, infrastructure. <laughs> then what happens is you've got to decide on how much irrigation water to apply, how much fertilizer to apply, uh, how much labor to put on the field, and you're hoping for good weather outcomes. The issue here is the areas in blue on this picture here, they're all things that the farmer chooses and often not in optimal ways. This is not being critical of the farmer, it's a tremendous amount of information you have to process in a world of uncertainty for people who are often liquidity constrained uh, in order to get whatever output you want. So you put all of this together, farmer, crop, and environment, and out comes the production in that given year. But once your crop is in the ground, you rely on the environment to give you a positive uh, realization for uh, better yields. Now, if we want to figure out uh, how much weather matters relative to these other factors like labor and fertilizer and pesticides and so on, we go to farms, right? We collect farm level data, so this is one study we did where we have uh, over multiple growing seasons for hundreds of farms in the main rice growing regions of, of Asia, we observe everything about these farms, both uh, human inputs, we observe what pesticides, what type of rice went on the field, when it went on the field, when it was harvested, what prices they were guaranteed. We know everything and we had weather stations on these fields or the data uh, actually had weather stations near these fields. So what we could do is we could actually subtract out in some sense the human part of, of uh, the, the yield response here and just focus on how important is weather once you subtract out this human uh, component. So what we got is uh, some feedback from a very brilliant referee who said, Max, this is all really interesting, but you're ignoring something really important here. If you just look at rice over an entire season, uh, you're ignoring something really important, which is that life has different life stages and you should look at weather during these different life stages of the plant. As we do with all referees, we responded and said that was an excellent idea. We've done this uh, and look at these amazing results. So here's what the amazing results were. This was a paper we had in PNAS a couple of years ago, which for minimum temperature, maximum temperature and radiation, because this is irrigated rice, rainfall doesn't matter that much. Uh, we looked at during what part of the, the growth, uh, the life stage of the rice plant, does what aspect of climate actually matter. So what we found here, and this is regression results from on-field farms, uh, is that, for example, minimum temperature during the ripening phase had a consistently negative impact on yields, no matter what you controlled for what other factors, right? We also see that uh, maximum temperature during the vegetative phase, for example, seemed to have a slight positive impact on, on rice yields. So what I want to say here is not that these are the, the final results on how the rice plant reacts to weather and, and climate, but the, the takeaway message here is we have to think about how climate change is going to affect yields on the actual farm with the farmer in the picture, which is incredibly important, and what the weather response is of on-field uh, crops, uh, rather than just focus on, on crop models. So bringing in the human dimension here, I think is an, an important uh, component to really figuring out what going forward the impacts are. So I have six minutes left to talk about overall impacts. Now, I've, this is a paper a colleague of mine wrote, uh, who's now back at Columbia, unfortunately, uh, which is a, in, in the journal Science, which looks at the impacts of observed trends in climate on the surface from 1960 till 2008. So what they did 
is pretty uh, nice. For global areas, they looked at which crops are grown where at the pixel level. And for the main crop in each area, they looked at the observed trends in weather or climate, whatever you want to call it, over this time period. So red areas in the top picture is temperature. Red areas got warmer. These are agricultural areas where you observe actual warming trends over this period. The bottom picture here is precipitation, where the red areas uh, are drying and the blue areas are, are, are wetter uh, periods. So what you're seeing here is a pretty consistent signal that over the agricultural landmass globally, on average, we've experienced warming trends over the past uh, 28 or so years. So this is the weather where it matters to those of us in the room, which is all of us interested in agriculture. It's gotten warmer, and in many areas it's gotten drier. In some areas it's actually gotten wetter. Now, if you look at temperature distribution since 1960 versus temperature distribution since 1980, the top two panels, the left one here, has the temperature trends over agricultural land that for blue is maize, yellow is uh, rice, the other one is wheat, and red is soy. I'm a little colorblind, so I can't tell these colors apart very well. But what you're seeing is, if you're just looking at the 1960 to 1980 trend, the trend is no different from sort of a randomly generated trend. But if you look at the temperature trend since 1980, 1980 to 2008, all the trends for all land for these four crops is statistically uh, bigger and different from a trend generated at random. So since 1980, we're seeing really significant increases in these temperature trends over agricultural land uh, globally. In precipitation, neither from 1960 to 1980 nor from 1980 to 2008 do you see uh, such a trend for these four uh, main crops. So the one thing we can say here is that it's gotten warmer over the land for the four main uh, food crops. If you look at what, there's a big black box in the middle in, in between these past two slides here, but if you're looking at the estimated net impact of these observed climate trends here, what you're seeing here is you're seeing some pretty big negative impacts, especially for corn uh, or maize in China and Brazil. Uh, you're seeing big impacts for wheat in, in Russia and soy. Uh, in Paraguay is the one that's statistically different from, from zero here. But the, the point I'm trying to make here is this is not projecting out to 2100, right? These are observed climate trends that we're, uh, we have measured over the past 30 years here and translated them into observed yield impacts onto the four main food crops. And in many regions of the world, we're already seeing uh, impacts on these, on these yields. Now, you can map this out by location, and you see this much more nicely on the big screen than on my little one here. Uh, red is bad, blue is good, so you can look by crop and country here what observed impacts of observed climate trends are on uh, yields by commodity here uh, since 1980. And what we're seeing here is, for example, for wheat in, in, in Brazil and Mexico and Russia, it's, it's negative. I mean, you could stare at these maps for a long time. But we're already seeing observed climate change negatively affecting uh, some crops. Some crops actually do better in, in, in certain areas, uh, but I only have 25 minutes total. If we look into the future, this is the most recent IPCC report. For those of you who haven't read Chapter 7 of Working Group 2, it's, it's well worth reading. David Lobel was one of the, the lead authors there. If we're looking at projected changes in crop yield as a function of time, this is synthesizing studies uh, across time and projection horizons here. What you're seeing is that you, as you go out to end of century here, fewer and fewer studies predict non-negative <coughs> changes of climate change on, on crop yields. We talked about prices earlier. Uh, this is a picture that, that was somewhat controversial before uh, this was put into the final report here, but this is, uh, David Lobel did this one. I don't know if we're supposed to reveal that, but David did this one. Uh, 
Uh, so what he looked at is he looked at the FAO food price index and looked at crop failure events of top five producers of certain crops. So if your crop output was 25% below what trend would have predicted, those are the vertical lines. And what you're seeing is that these crop failures, all of which were essentially extreme weather events, think of the Russia heat wave, think of Australia, for example, uh, all of these events uh, were followed by a price spike, right? Global commodity markets are complicated. Storage really matters here. Uh, it's not just climate change here, but if you have one of the main producing regions like the United States having a really, really bad year for one of the main commodities and storage levels are low, you get huge price spikes. The one thing I would want to warn uh, of here, extrapolating uh, linearly price increases out of sample for anything more than a year or two is a really dangerous thing to do. Uh, it's not something one should do, and it would overpredict almost certainly the experienced food price increases we're, we're going to see. And there are statistical reasons I'm happy to point out during uh, questions. I have two more minutes, and then I'm done. So the one thing we haven't really talked about is irrigation water availability. It'll get warmer. All the models agree. Uh, It'll get wetter and drier in some areas of the globe, so some areas will experience more rainfall, more extreme uh, rainfall events, for example. But this has led people to sort of think, well, precipitation is uncertain and models disagree. Well, even if you don't buy the bottom picture and you think there's disagreement in, in rainfall uh, projections, the top picture causes huge amounts of problems for irrigation water availability. How do we store irrigation water? We store it mostly in snowpacks. Snowpacks hate warmth, right? They melt, and then what happens is you get smaller snowpacks that melt more rapidly early in the season, and you get a lot of water when you, you know, don't necessarily need all of it early in the season, and none of it at the end of the season. So if we just worry about warming, this is the California snowpack uh, projections here. We're going to be in trouble uh, no matter what in terms of irrigation water. Also, if you look at the recently published studies on pumping in, in for example, northern China, California, or the western United States, we're pumping groundwater at rates that, that ha are unprecedented. So water availability for irrigation, which is responsible for you know, three quarters of the rice crop uh, in the world, is something we should really worry about. I will leave this up since I'm all, already out of time here, but maybe one thing to, to, to say at the end here is we do these aggregate projections of calorie availability in certain you know, uh, climate scenarios and there will be enough crop here and there. If you worry about food security, and I probably don't need to tell this to anybody in the room, but I'll say it anyway, food security is local, right? Whether you can get food to the people is not just how much is grown globally, but is it can you get to the people demanding the calories at a given point in time? Infrastructure, information, uh, transportation availability, storage, all these factors that many of you in the room study really matter here. So I'm thinking in the climate change literature, while it is a global problem, when we study the, the problem of food security, it would do us service well to focus on the local, not so much on the, on the global here when we do these uh, projections. And there's some other morsels here, but I will stop. Thank you. OK, questions for Max? That's a fascinating uh, uh, talk. So uh, although the precipitation may, and all these models, be uncertain, the groundwater depletion is certainly not uncertain. No. And it's not going to come back. Uh, I'm surprised that your uh, analysis didn't make that a more prominent driver, even more prominent than the temperature, you know, given, I mean, the GRACE data from the satellite is just stunning. Yeah. Okay, it's not going to come back. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, so one of the problems when you're working with observed data is you need observed data. So our measures of groundwater availability locally for India, which is where we did most of our work, are, are not very good. Even in California, where we should have good data on how much pumping is, is happening, we have almost no data on how much water people are pumping uh, out of the ground. 
So it's empirically speaking the big unknown, and this is something where simulation models, David Silverman does, does models like this sometimes that just sort of make, it, make assumptions and you simulate what the, what the impact uh, would be there are, are key. Uh, but we just don't have really good data on, on what water availability is at the field level in many areas. And this makes me incredibly nervous, so I share your, your concern. So you, you've laid out some important sustainability challenges um, and shown ties between prices and climate change. How should we think about uh, institutional innovation? So economists think about induced innovation and uh, a lot of that has been in technological innovation, and Steve gave us a great talk thinking about potential induced technological innovation. But what about institutional innovations? So I think this is, uh, there, I could spend hours uh, talking about this, which I won't, because I'll be tackled off the stage. But there are many different aspects to that question, right? Uh, there is, for example, one of my graduate students works on food security in, in Niger, right? There are famines that happen and grains don't flow in there even though prices are high. So for example, one thing that you can show is better information infrastructure sponsored by better institutions allow traders to have access to better information to know when prices are high to shift food supply into these regions. So I think you know, on the information side, on the storage side, on the information provision side to farmers, uh, better information sharing amongst uh, people who are doing all these different uh, crop experiments uh, globally uh, is, is key here. I mean, on the research side, we know very little about how crops respond to, to climate in Africa, for example, which is you know, a system where things are under extreme stress already, and a big thing of that was data scarcity. So why did it take you know, David Lobel to did not David, but why did it take us till 2008 for somebody to go to the to 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 Simit and, and all these other places and say, well, give us all the data on your on your crop model experiments. Let's build a weather data set and see what these responses look like. So I think if you're talking about institutional reform, it's both on the academic side, it's on the information side, it's on uh, government response to to these extreme events side. Uh, there is much, much work to do. We're all focusing on mitigation and what happened in New York was, was really great and what's gonna happen in, in Paris is going to be really good. But when we're thinking about how to address these challenges, there are much deeper levels of institutional reform that we're going to need that we're really not thinking about as much as we do about mitigation policy. All right. I'm afraid to keep to time, I'm going to have to ask you to uh, pose your questions uh, during the coffee break, but please join me in uh, thanking Professor Ross.